Okay, with the eight children, I'm, I'm used to projecting. I probably don't need the microphone, but I will use it. Um, I was delighted last week when Father Gates came up to me and told me that uh, he and I had a connection that I didn't know about until last week, and that's that Father Gates and my son David, who's a captain in the United States Army, were students together at Ave Maria College in Ypsilanti, Michigan. So that preceded the move to Florida. Now we had Ave Maria University, but Father Gates uh, and David were together. I, I mentioned Father to, to my son David. He said, oh yeah, Father Joe, we're still in touch and has fond memories of your father. So I'm delighted to that ends kind of reunited with Father. Um, a disclaimer, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so why am I talking to you about end-of-life issues? Well, I kind of, I got it because I'm a member of the Catholic Medical Association, and I am well-versed in church teaching on end-of-life issues. I've given a number of talks on it. But even, even an orthopedic surgeon runs into this issue, not commonly. So I'm not commonly taking care of people on a ventilator or in the ICU, but I do have people who end up on ventilators and in the ICU after car accidents or after fractures. So I have a, a fair amount of experience with it, and I, and I think I do know the Catholic perspective. Um, I'm not infallible. I'm not uh, Father Cooney. I don't have his brilliance and depth of knowledge and reading, uh, but I'll do the best that I can for you. I want to give you a little bit of uh, a perspective on this issue. You may recall in about 1991, there was a New York Times bestseller, and the title of it was Final Exit. And that book was written by Derek Humphrey, who was famous for being the founder of the Hemlock Society. And through that book and through subsequent editions, uh, Mr. Humphrey projected the concept of, quote, death with dignity. And he was really a founder and a proponent of advancing the the uh, agenda of people who believe that we should be able to terminate our own lives or that we should be able to have physicians help us die in some manner. Uh, this created quite a firestorm and, and a lot of controversy. What's happened since then, we know that in Holland they have legalized physician uh, euthanasia, basically. Not physician-assisted suicide, but euthanasia where doctors actually directly kill people. And, you know, for the people who thought that that was okay for the terminally ill, I can tell you that now there are criteria for terminating, in Holland, terminating newborn infants based on their level of capacity or incapacity. So what started out as treatment for the terminally ill uh, has now gone over into the pediatric realm. So it's, it is a slippery slope. That's a, a, a worn out term and probably overused, but it truly is in this instance. So be aware of that. Be aware also that in three states in, in this country now that physician-assisted suicide is legal, first in Oregon, then in Washington State, now in the state of Vermont. Uh, there are people right now in this state working on this agenda through, through the Pulse Initiative and through uh, the Right to Die movement and trying to get physician-assisted suicide in the state. So, we're Catholics. I assume that everyone in this room is Catholic or interested in the Catholic perspective. So, the Catholic perspective is easy. It's so clear it makes a lot of sense. And that's what I want to go with, through with you tonight. Um, Look at this slide of this lady and, and the concept, I wouldn't want to live like that. Well, who would? There she is. She's in an intensive care unit. She's on a ventilator. She can't breathe for herself. She has a nasogastric tube in for feeding because she's unable to feed or give herself nutrition. Uh, she's unresponsive, in a coma, not able to communicate, not able to tell you if she's in pain not able to tell you whether she wants to continue the treatment that's been given her. So who would want to live like that? Well, the answer is nobody, really. I mean, we all walked in here tonight. Some of you pushed a walker, a couple of people in the cane. Most of us came right in, okay? So which of us would want to be in this situation? We wouldn't. But sometimes, with just a stroke of God's hand, we find ourselves in a situation that's life-threatening. 
had an experience myself about 11 years ago, bike accident, two, um, a punctured lung, two chest tubes, five broken ribs, and I was sick, and without the chest tubes I would have died. So I went from being on my bicycle to being deathly injured, or near death in injury, in a, in a matter of seconds, it could happen. Anyone leaving tonight could be in this. So we wouldn't want to live like that, but sometimes that's the only life that we have. So what's the fear? But when we look at this, we said, we, want to, we don't want to be like that, so what's the fear? It's a loss of control, a loss of dignity, and the fear of being a prisoner of technology. In a sense, this woman is a prisoner, isn't she? I mean, she's there, she can't interact, she can't intercede, she can't raise her hand and say, I'm feeling this way, I need help. Or she can't even say, I've had enough of this, will you leave me alone? And you may remember the book by Robin Cook Coleman, which people went in for elective surgery and then were anesthetized, kept in, 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 in suspended animation while their organs were harvested. Um, I'll tell you, we're not too far from that right now. With some of the brain death criteria that are used are, are sketchy. There are many cases of people have been, been declared brain dead and scheduled for organ harvest. A family member comes in, pinches their big toe, they stir, and they say, wait, doctor, look. And they say, hey, wait a second. Maybe they're not dead. And they were ready for organ harvest. Do not underestimate the amount of money involved in organ harvesting, okay? So if you sign that declaration you want to give your organs to medical care, beware to make sure that they're following the right criteria, to make sure that you are dead dead before they take your organs. <laughs> so what's the human response to the fear? We say, hey, wait, this is my life. I'm in this bed. I want to have control over this. So how, how do you exert control when you're not there and you can't speak? yourself. One is through a living will. And that's a document in which you put out as clearly as you can what you do and do not want done at the end of your life. At that moment when you're in the intensive care unit and critically ill. This uh, spurned the death with dignity movement that we talked about uh, that was uh, put forth so strongly uh, by Derek Humphrey. The Hemlock Society, by the way, is now called Compassionate Care or Compassionate Friends, depending where you are. So Hemlock is a little dark, okay? So now it's compassion. As Father Cooney said last week, what does compassion mean? Compatior? It means to suffer with someone. It doesn't mean to come in and eliminate their suffering by eliminating them. It means to come in to hold their hand, to help them, to, to kind of walk that road with them. It's not compassionate to kill someone, okay? Physician-assisted suicide, which your eyes have mentioned, is in three states, and then euthanasia, which is direct killing of someone, typically by a physician. So that's the human response. What's the Catholic response? First, this is a reiteration of what Father Cooney said, our lives belong to God. So we are the stewards we're not the owners of our lives. They're not our lives. They've been given to us as a gift from God. Like our children. They're not our children. They're God's children. We're their custodians for a period of time. All right. And because of that, we must take reasonable measures to preserve our lives. Because they're not ours. They're God's. We're the custodians of them. We should preserve them. It says reasonable measures, not unreasonable. Okay. None of the Catholic position it is unreasonable. And then the reality that when you talk about the death with dignity movement, the reality that we know that our dignity rests in the reality that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Okay? So every Ash Wednesday, remember we have the ashes and we said, You are dust, and unto dust you shall return. So absence the hand of God, we're nothing. We've been created by Him and for Him. And that, in, in that, our dignity rests, not in what we look like, or what we're able to do, or what we're able to say or accomplish. Those are, those are accidents, those are things that we can accomplish. 
It has nothing to do with our dignity. Our dignity is because we were made in the image and likeness of God himself. So the Catholic response uh, was, is very well articulated in uh, a document put out by the United States Council of Catholic Bishops. It's now in its fifth edition. And it's called the Ethical and Relig Religious Directives, or ERDS, or the ERDS, as doctors call them, the ERDS, the ERD, or the ERDs. Um, very well articulated uh, position on Catholic health care and the expectations of Catholic health care providers, okay? So what is the Catholic position? And this is right from the ERDS. This is from the, uh, from the preamble to it. As the Christ's redemption and saving grace embrace the whole person, especially in his or her illness, suffering, and death. The Catholic health care ministry faces the reality of death with the confidence of faith. In the face of death, for many, a time when hope seems lost, the church witnesses to her belief that God has created each person for eternal life. We're all just passing through here. We're all just pilgrims on the way. Directives 56 and 57 point out where we should be in relative to that slide with the, uh, with the woman in the intensive care unit. A person has a moral obligation to use ordinary or proportionate means of preserving his or her life. Ordinary or proportionate. In the fourth edition of the ERDs, the bishops used the term ordinary. The problem with that is that none of what was happening to that woman is ordinary for us, walking in here tonight, and the tracheal tube, nasal gastric tube, monitors, pressors, IVs. None of that's normal or ordinary for us. It's ordinary for physicians. So they, they changed that language to make it proportionate. And proportionate means specifically uh, those means that are in the judgment of the patient. This is important to understand. Not of the doctor or anyone else. In the judgment of the patient. So you are able to use discretion in the care that you get. And the judgment of the patient offer a reasonable hope of benefit. And do not entail an expensive burden on the patient. I, paraphr I took a little section of the out because it was so long. Excessive burden on the patient or expense on the family or community. All right? So, proportionate needs in the judgment of the patient. Ethical and religious directives. A person may forego extraordinary or disproportionate means of preserving life. So, ordinary, proportionate, yes. Disproportionate, no. What's disproportionate? Disproportionate means are those that in the patient's judgment do not offer a reasonable hope of benefit or entail an excessive burden or expense on family or community. All right, we're clear on that. Disproportionate means are those that in the patient's judgment do not offer a reasonable hope of benefit or entail excessive burden on the patient or expense on the family or community. So it's the patient's judgment. So the question is, is this proportionate? Well, is it? It depends. Depends on what? Circumstances. It's hard to articulate every circumstance in the living well, isn't it? This is a very, this is a very, whatever this person has here, it's a very unique position and circumstance for this person. So it depends. What? Is this a terminal condition? Uh, does she have pancreatic cancer? It's metastatic and from which she's expected to die in the next six weeks. Or has she just had a, a perforated colon and has had it washed out in a diversion, and has had respiratory failure, and is being supported for the next several days until she comes to? Is it a terminal condition? What's her underlying disorder? That would tell you whether it's proportionate or not. If she has pancreatic cancer, I would opine that this is probably disproportionate. Probably more than she should have or needs. She's the best judge of that, but she can't speak for herself now. We'll get into who can speak for her in, in a few minutes. 
So what's a terminal condition? A, ter a terminal condition is a condition that has no cure and it will cause death in a relatively short period of time. So no cure, death is in it. That's the terminal. So go back, is it proportion? Depends. Is it a terminal condition or not? So how do we express our wishes and remain Catholic? And we do that through advanced directives and living wills. Now, this document, this is the whole document, we're going to break it down. This is a secular document that's, that's standard fare in Florida. This is a typical document that you would be presented with if you came into Venice Regional Medical Center. It's a secular document. It has two parts to it. The first part is the living will, and the second part is the designation of health care surrogate. Let's look at the living will part. This is not a Catholic document. Under A, life prolonging procedures. If at any time I am both mentally and physically incapacitated and I have a terminal condition or an end stage condition or am in a persistent vegetative state. So there's a preamble to this. If this, 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 and this, okay, and there's more, my attending or treating physician and another consulting physician have determined that there's no reasonable medical probability of recovery from such condition. Then I direct that life prolonging procedures be withheld or withdrawn when the application of such procedures would serve only to prolong artificially the process of dying and that I be permitted to die naturally with only the administration of medication or the performance of any procedure deemed necessary to provide me with comfort, care, or to alleviate pain. So we don't get to the conclusion until we go through this long preamble of conditions. It's terminal, end stage, PBS, and I'm not expecting recovery, and my attending and one other doctor opine that there's really not much they can do for me then. This kicks in. I'm saying, so it's not really all that bad a document in some ways. It's a little problematic on the PBS side. We'll go over that. Uh, a terminal condition, and this is Florida statute. So this is an actionable document. This is legal in Florida. Now we're talking about legality because once you enter the hospital, the hospital's under Florida statute and federal statute. So a terminal condition in the Florida statute is a condition caused by injury disease or illness from which there is no reasonable medical probability of recovery and which without treatment can be expected to cause death. All right, so that's under Florida statute. It's a little bit problematic. Um, several years ago, I, I shared a table with uh, Victoria Flug, now Victoria Berkiaga, married to Dr. Berkiaga. Uh, Victoria was the, 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 the attorney for the diocese, and she was given the legal side, and I was given the medical side, and I pointed this out to her. I said, well, this is really pretty watertight. She said, oh, no, actually, because it says that a terminal condition under the statute is any condition which without treatment can be expected to cause death. Any condition. That could be appendicitis. Think about it. So if somebody wants to push this, if a, a family member says, hey, dad has a living will, um, I want you to take him off the ventilator, I say, he's not an internal condition. Well, under the statute, actually, you could argue that he does. There's any condition that without treatment could potentially cause death. And Victoria illuminated, you know, educated me on that, on that fact that day. Now, what's an end stage condition? Florida statute, again. An irreversible condition that is caused by injury, disease, or illness which has resulted in progressively severe and permanent deterioration, and for which, to a reasonable degree of medical probability, the treatment of the irreversible condition would be ineffective. Okay? So that's an end stage condition. Progressively severe, permanent deterioration. That could be Parkinson's disease. My wife, I don't know if you know that my wife has Parkinson's disease. Thank God she's doing well on mineral medications. But under the statute, Somebody could push this and say, let's well, an end stage condition. And we're going to have an example of that in a bit that I'm going to talk to you about. Now, persistent vegetative state. 
We've all heard about this because of the, because of the Terry Schiavo case. And this is statute again, Florida statute. A persistent vegetative state is a permanent, irreversible condition of unconsciousness in which there is A, the absence of voluntary action or cognitive behavior of any kind, and B, the inability to communicate or interact purposefully with the environment. So purposeful interaction, absence of voluntary action or cognitive behavior. Persistent vegetative state. And here, you know, Terry um, is the poster child of this condition. And you know what happened to her. She was starved to death by, uh, by the act of the judge. So in someone with PBS, they maintain a sleep-wake cycle. All right, they do not require machines to stay alive. Terry didn't need a machine to stay alive. She had a, a feeding tube through her abdominal wall. And they can respond to certain kinds of stimuli, touch and pain, but they don't interact purposefully with the environment. All her parents would argue that she did. Now, the rest of the document. This is the secular document. Pretty good on this, nutrition and hydration. If I, if I have a condition stated above, it is my pre preference to receive artificially administered nutrition and hydration. Okay? So the bias on this is, yes, I want to be fed and I want to be adequately hydrated. There's a pretty good pregnancy clause here. Basically said, if I'm pregnant, all right, if the woman is pregnant, then none of the above apply. In other words, you will keep me alive until my baby is delivered. All right, there's no, there's no, no proviso whereby my life or comfort would take precedence of the life and safety of my child. The second part of the document is the designation of health care surrogate. So first is a living will and then the health care surrogate. In the event that I've been determined to be incapacitated to provide informed consent for medical treatment and surgical and diagnostic procedures, I wish to designate as my surrogate for health care decisions, fill in the blank. Okay, so someone could speak in your behalf. My surrogate must act consistently with my desires as stated in this document or otherwise made known. Michael Schiavo argued that Terry had privately told him if she were in this condition, she would want to live. That was his argument, okay? So the surrogate must act consistently with wishes. In the document, she didn't have a living will, or is otherwise made known. So he said, by private conversation, she told me this, and hence I'm gonna act on that, okay? That's the secular document. Let's go over the Catholic document. It's a better document. I'm going to point out why. Uh, the Catholic Declaration on Life and Death was approved by the bishops of Florida. And it, uh, it's entitled the Catholic Declaration on Life and Death. We have multiple copies. I want everyone, please, to take a copy home with you tonight to look at it. It's a good preamble, good discussion on the Catholic principles, and then a good document. Um, and it starts out, I believe that I've been created for eternal life in union with God. The truth that my life is a precious gift from God has profound implications for the question of stewardship over my life. Again, it's stewardship, not ownership. It's not my life. It's God's life, but God has allowed me to be the steward of it. I have a duty to preserve my life and to use it for God's glory, but the duty to preserve my life is not absolute. For I may reject life-prolonging procedures that are insufficiently beneficial or excessively burdensome. So the bishops in this document have given you great latitude in the treatment that you may choose to receive. It ultimately comes to you. All right, there's no, there's no mandatory element of this. Keep in mind the principle that we're stewards and we are to do, take reasonable measures, measures to preserve our lives. In the document, suicide and euthanasia are never the morally acceptable options. Next week there's going to be a video, I believe, on euthanasia, so please come to hear that and the, and the reasons why we reject that. They're never morally acceptable. If I should become irreversibly and terminally ill, I request to be fully informed of my condition so that I can prepare myself spiritually 
spiritually for death and witness to my belief in Christ's redemption. So, the Catholic Declaration says, if there's a terminal condition or an end-stage condition, it takes out the PBS. Persistent vegetative state is, does not fall in and, and any of these categories because it's not a progressive end-stage condition. It's not progressively deteriorating. It's not a terminal illness. It's what it is. That person is where he or she is. They're sort of stuck there. They're not interacting. They can't voice you know, reason, they cannot interact with their environment. But they don't fall into any, any, any of the categories by which you would say we're going to stop treating here. Alright, so if terminal or end stage condition, I would be provided with care and comfort, that my pain is relieved, that no excessively burdensome or disproportionate needs be used to prolong my life. And there should be a presumption in favor of providing nutrition and hydration, including medically assisted nutrition and hydration, unless they cannot reasonably be expected to prolong my life, or the means used to deliver the nutrition and hydration are excessively burdensome and do not offer sufficient benefit, or would cause me significant physical discomfort, or I'm imminently dying from an irreversible condition. So, again, the, the bias is towards nutrition and hydration unless it's either not working or it's causing further complications and discomfort or I'm terminally ill. So back to Terry Chow, okay, the PBS. The bishops took the PBS option out of this, okay? Pers persistent vegetative state, we covered that. Uh, sorry, back up. One of the problems with that term is vegetative. We think of turnips and things like that that aren't human, right? So, and this is a quote from, or a position from the National Catholic Bioethics Center. And the quote, the term vegetative does not mean that the person has become less than human, but rather has lost the sort of awareness that characterizes normal adult human life. So it's still it's a human being. I remember during the Terry Schiavo controversy, um, while she was still alive, I got into an argument with a couple of uh, physicians on this issue. One of them said, she's a vegetable, which she's not. And I argued, well, she's not a vegetable, she's a human being. Well, she can't interact. The second one said, she's brain dead. But she clearly wasn't brain dead. Right? She had cortical dysfunction and couldn't interact, but she was not brain dead. But we'll go into the brain death definition right now. Brain death is irreversible unconsciousness with complete loss of brain functions, including the brain stem, although the heartbeat may continue. The brain stem uh, controls respiration, blood pressure, heart rate, and a lot of other autonomic functions that are going on inside you and me right now out of our control. Thank God that they're not in our control because I'd probably forget to do them. But there's a lot going on in us that's beyond our control, okay? So uh, brain death involves death of not only the cortex. So Terry Shadow had severe cortical disruption. She couldn't think, interact, as far as we know. But her vital signs were fine. Her respirations were normal. She wasn't on a ventilator. She didn't require any machinery at all, okay? So don't get confused brain death versus persistent vegetative state. Brain death should be understood as the ultimate clinical expression of a brain catastrophe characterized by a complete and irreversible, irreversible neurologic stoppage recognized by irreversible coma, absent brain stem reflexes, and apnea. Apnea means the inability to breathe. Okay? And the, the Catholic Church does recognize brain death as a legitimate criterion for death of the whole person. I will just tell you there's a lot of discussion in the Catholic Medical Association about it. Uh, Blessed John Paul II came up pretty clearly on this issue. He didn't talk about the science, he talked about the philosophy behind it, of the brain being the organizing principle of the human person. Um, there's still some discussion among doctors. I'm not a huge brain death 
proponent or fan. Um, and then my concern about it is that the criteria for determining brain death are inconsistently applied. You have to be very careful that they're that they're carefully applied, consistently applied. So. Persistent vegetative state. And this is the allocution of John Paul II in 1994 at a conference on the persistent vegetative state. And here the Catholic position on artificial nutrition and hydration was very clearly articulated by the Holy Father. He said, I should like particularly to underline how the administration of water and food, even when provided by artificial means, always represents a natural means of preserving life. So he was specifically talking about the persistent vegetative state. Its use furthermore should be considered in principle, in principle, ordinary, and as such, morally obligatory. And that was an allocution in 2000, I said 1994, I'm sorry, it was 2004. Got the four part right. Uh, more, uh, his allocution said that it was normal care and a natural means of preserving life and not a medical act. Here's a little cartoon. Uh, I don't know if you can read this. I hope you can. Man and a woman are lounging together. And, and the man says, just so you know, I never want to live in a vegetative state dependent on some machine. If that ever happens, just unplug me, okay? And she says, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> she's made a determine as his surrogate that he's in a vegetative state. And she pulled the plug on his, on his reality, which is that TV screen. Okay? So it's funny, but it's really philosophically quite deep if you think about it, okay? So, here he is watching the TV. This is his reality. He thinks, this is my life, this is cool, this is good. And someone else comes along and says, um, you know what, um, this isn't right, this isn't good. Pull the plug. He says, wait a second, you just stopped out my life as I know it. So, I said before, we all walked in here. None of us want to be on that ventilator. None of us want to be in that condition. But I can tell you over and over again, I've seen people in that condition who fight for their lives, who have had living wills signed, and they're continuing to fight for their lives. So what's the next thing to talk about? And this is a dangerous document. It's called POLST, P-O-L-S-T, it's an acronym. It stands for Physicians Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. There are now about 16 states with POLST documents in them. There's an active POLST initiative in Florida, and there's actually in Lee County now a POLST pilot project going on, okay? You need to know what it is. What is it? And how, what, how did it arise, first of all? First, there was a concern that advanced directives are not enough to ensure that patients' wishes are carried out. So the question is, is an advanced directive honored, particularly in a terminally ill person? It's an actionable medical order. It's not a request from the patient. It's an order from a doctor that in the states that have it is binding on all caregivers. If that document is on file in a database and the EMTs come on the scene and they pull it up, it's an order. It's as if a doctor is right there saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. It's an order. It's binding on physicians and caregivers in all settings, hospital, emergency room, nursing home, ambulatory care centers, the highway for EMTs. Now the original intent was for patients whose death was imminent. Go back to Holland, remember the initial intent in Holland for euthanasia was for the terminally ill who are irretrievably suffering and it's gone now to terminating newborn infants. That's what's going on in Holland. So you start with something that that's, seems like it makes sense and it runs off the rails pretty quickly. This is a document. Now this is the one from Wisconsin. Now I'm going to go through this in some detail and I hope I can, I'm going to try to keep you awake and then we'll be wrapping it up at the end with a couple of examples. Um, the first thing it says at the top of this document, this is, this is the law in Wisconsin. 
it says that um, the first thing you have to do is that first follow these orders, then contact the physician. All right, so the, these are the orders of a physician. Don't rely on contacting the doctor. Do this first. And actually, what it tells you is don't do this first. Don't do anything. The first part of it is says that um, if the patient is not breathing and has no pulse, either going to resuscitate or not resuscitate, DNR. I would say that this is a reasonable document as someone with pancreatic cancer or a terminal cancer. There are probably people in this room with cancer. I know there are people in this room that have cancer and been treated for it, okay? It, it's probably not in the terminal stages. If it gets to the terminal stages, everything's been done that can be reasonably done. And you're progressing down a rapid downward spiral. And he had the opportunity to receive the sacraments and get right with God and neighbor and you're ready to go, that's a reasonable thing to do. To say, you know what, I don't want anybody jumping on my chest and hitting me with paddles. I'm ready to go because God is taking me out, okay? So that's reasonable. Section B, though, says, it says that, all right, now, um, if I have a pulse or I'm breathing, then you can do this, this, and this, comfort measures only. Um, I could be at the restaurant down here talking to Colleen with my mouth full, like, 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 like before, inhale a piece of meat, and, and end up with a respiratory arrest and still have a pulse at the point. Is it, should I be just kind of left there like that? I don't think so. I, I would want to make sure I have treatment. But the options are comfort measures, limited interventions. Comfort measures only means they're not going to do much at all for me. I'm just going to die at the restaurant. Or look at the third thing. It's called aggressive treatment. Aggressive. Then look at the language. Aggressive treatment. So airway management, taking the piece of meat, doing a Heimlich, clearing my airway, that's aggressive treatment? I don't think so. But the language is, why not call it just full treatment? or complete medical treatment, what's aggressive, aggressive, sounds like, whoa, we're really doing something big here. That's ordinary treatment, it shouldn't be called aggressive. Again, under antibiotics, no antibiotics except for comfort. No invasive antibiotics, IV or IN. So you can give the oral antibiotics, assuming I can swallow. Or the last is aggressive treatment. So they call intravenous antibiotics, or intramuscular antibiotics, aggressive. Why call it aggressive? Why not call it full treatment? So there's bias built into this document. It gets worse. The next is pretty good. Artificially administrated uh, fluids and nutrition, you know, whether they have a feeding tube or not. Remember the Catholic principles on this, though, that, that nutrition and hydration should be considered ordinary, all right, and, and proportionate, unless you're terminally ill, unless you're imminently dying. This is the worst part, all right, section E. Look at the bottom, it says, signature of physician or nurse practitioner, mandatory. Physician name, print, time of day, Sunday. Do you see anything for the patient on there? No. There is no place on the form for the patient to acknowledge that they've been informed of what's on the piece of paper, that they concur with it, and that those are, in fact, their wishes. So this is a physician's order. They could apply to you or me on file in the state of Wisconsin because it's a big database. Signed by a doctor or a nurse practitioner, that's mandatory, that hasn't been signed by me. This violates every principle of informed consent. If you come to me and you have a minor problem uh, in your hand or your foot and I recommend a minor procedure as an outpatient, we don't sign a document this long, a lot of fine print. Doctors told me this, 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 I agree, I concur to do, to do for nothing, okay? This document allows a physician or nurse practitioner to put an actual medical order that binds all people in the state of Wisconsin, doctors, nurses, and practitioners, and if it's there and on file, and you haven't signed it, and you code, they can't resuscitate you. It's a crazy thing. It gets worse. Well, here's the basic. It annuls the requirement that the patient must be terminally ill. So there's no preamble necessarily. It doesn't say, in the event that I blah, 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 blah. 
No, it doesn't matter. It says, this is where I am. It advocates the Catholic sense of proportionate and disproportionate treatment. There's no discussion of that at all. It's just whatever's, whatever's ever checked in the box, they're going to do what isn't, they won't do. Complex situations are reduced to check boxes. Forms are completed before the patient knows the extent of their illness or the treatment options. And depending on the state, that's this concept. In Oregon, it's optional. Patient signature, optional. Okay, I would think I'd want a mandatory if it's that I thank you if I'm in Oregon, all right? Uh, it violates physician autonomy. If I'm the receiving physician in the ER, a person comes in with this, they, and I'm ready to go and take care of them, they say, no, you can't do anything. So why are they here? And I'm just going to sit here and watch this person die? I don't think that's fair to the doctor. I already covered that. Nurse practitioner to sign it. Not even a doctor. Not was well, nice by a doctor, just a nurse practitioner. Not to belittle nurse practitioners, but that's a lot of power for someone to have. Biased language, aggressive treatment instead of complete treatment. Pulse but no breathing can equal no treatment. Here's a case report, and I want you to run this by you. The case concerns Emily Darron, who lived with brain cancer for most of her young life. As she approached her final months, her parents met with her oncologist, her neurosurgeon, and a medical ethicist, to discuss Emily's care in light of her rapid decline. Together, they completed a physician order for life-sustaining treatment, which documented her parents' decisions, her parents' decisions, I, I don't know if Emily could participate, but parents' decisions and official physician instructions. Now, several weeks after completion of the pulsed form, Emily's parents found her unconscious in bed. They rushed her rushed her to the nearby emergency room affiliated with Kaiser, Emily's provider. They told the staff about her post, which included the order do not intubate. They did not want Emily to endure any painful invasive procedures in her final days. Follow the language. The emergency physician failed to honor the order and, quote, forced, end quote, a breathing tube down Emily's throat. He intubated her. I don't know if that's forcing it, too. He put it in, she's not breathing. She endured the presence of the tube until she was transferred to another Kaiser facility where doctors withdrew it and allowed Emily to die. Okay, so the obvious question is, to me, and this, if that was the decision the parents had made, why did they rush her to the hospital? Why not have an understanding that Emily's not going to go to the hospital if Emily's ready to die? And for the doctor there, the doctor, early on in the post uh, discussion, this is in Oregon, by the way, early on in the post discussion, the doctor may or may not be aware of the post document, may not have been indoctrinated in the fact that you will do exactly what's on the document. And then the, the language that you forced a breathing tube down her throat. Now, so they decided to withdraw treatment. That's reasonable. But now the parents are suing the doctor, Kaiser, the hospital, and everybody. And either, I'm sure they're angry and upset, mostly because their daughter died. And their poor daughter endured a, a tough life. It's hard on a parent. And that does create anger. You know, anger is only stages of grief, right? It's there. It's real. It started with the terminally ill and then it's expanded. The National Pulse Paradigm Task Force says that in order to determine whether a person should have a pulsed document, the clinician should ask, would I be surprised if this patient died in the next 12 months? So 12 months. I wouldn't be surprised if I died in 12 I could heal over any time. You never know what God's going to take, okay? So, but the facilitators in a nursing home, they treat, they train social workers, they treat, uh, they train ministers, they train um, chaplains to have these discussions and have people sign, sign, fill out the documents that I signed, and then a doctor signs it, okay? Would I be surprised if this person died in 12 months? It gets worse, okay? In New Jersey, the state recommends that doctors and nurses complete the form in all patients who have a life expectancy of fewer than five years. <laughs> So again, slippery slope. Terminally ill, one year, five years, who's next? 
All right, so these are the people, the people who are, the language they use is very problematic, too. There's seven objections in, in, from the NCBC on this. And I'm going to go, I already said this, and time's moving on. Um, this is from the script in Wisconsin for the facilitator, the non-doctor, the facilitator is talking to the nursing home patient. Quote, the artificial nutrition is delivered through tubes. It often moves out of the stomach and slips into the lungs, causing pneumonia. Artificial hydration that is delivered may also increase the amount of fluid, causing extra fluid in the lungs, making it more difficult to breathe. So I'm a facilitator talking to the person in the nursing home. You wouldn't want that, would you? No, wouldn't want that. Okay. So the script that the people have, the non-physician has, is threatening. It's scary. Go back to the first slide, okay? You wouldn't want to live that way, would you? You wouldn't want the food pouring into your lungs, would you? Would you want to be gasping for breath, would you? No, 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 okay, no, 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 no. Here's the next thing, pulse. This is again from the facilitator thing. You may have fears, this is from right from Wisconsin. This is right from the manual, this is a quote. You may have fears about not getting food or water. You may think you will starve or be uncomfortable. That's not true. When food and water are not given, you will die naturally from your chronic illness. You will not feel hungry, and you will receive good care to make you comfortable. Okay? That's from the manual. It's based on a simplistic checklist. That woman in the intensive care, there's no checklist for what she has. You have to really evaluate each situation. So, in Oregon, dangerous document. No patient signature, no physician signature. Could be an ARNP, physician's assistant. No physician's license number. It says physician name and signature, mandatory. License number, optional. Well, how do they know he's a doctor? Whose name is that? Do you think they're going through and saying, okay, my place Jake with MD, okay, yeah, he's legit. How does they know it is me? I don't even have the license number. Why not make the life, why make it optional? Why wouldn't it be mandatory? Scary stuff. And it's automatically sent to a state registry. So there's a database. The EMTs go, boom. Is this guy in the database? Boom, there he is. And you get to a quick look. All right? This is a white paper put out by the Catholic Medical Association. It's long. It's very detailed. It goes through all of the objections of the CMA. I want to point out a couple names out here. One is Peter Morrow. Peter is in Orlando. And he'll be the incoming president of the Catholic Medical Association at the meeting that I'm going to attend in Santa Barbara next week. The other is Rita Marker, who is a very famous for her refutation of Derek Humphrey's book. Humphrey read final, read, uh, wrote Final Exit. Rita Marker wrote the book Deadly Compassion. And she refutes most of what Humphrey says. Rita befriended Humphrey's wife, Anne, who was dying of breast cancer in her later days and supported her as Humphrey continued to pressure Anne to die. It's an ugly story. And uh, Rita Marker is speaking tomorrow night in Fort Myers. I'm going to go down and listen to her speak. You're listening to an amateur. She's an expert. If you want details on that talk, I'll give it to you. But tomorrow uh, night in Fort Myers, she's speaking. National nationally recognized expert on euthanasia. She started the anti-euthanasia task force a number of years ago in Steubenville, Ohio. An amazing lady. All right, I'm going to give you a couple cases and I'm going to let you, let you rest. Here's a case, all right? These are real cases. You be the doctor. You tell me what you ought to do here. 74-year-old healthy man is scheduled for a hip replacement surgery. Three days prior to the surgery, he tells the surgeon that he is, quote, DNR, end quote, do not resuscitate, and does not want to be resuscitated. What should the doctor do? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, well, 
Um, that depends on the, yes, because in order for you to have a surgery, all right, it depends on the surgery, okay? But that's not necessarily the case. It's not necessarily the case in Florida, all right? So here we are, we're in Florida. Elective surgery, hip replacement, three days prior, tells the doctor, I have a DNR. So in other words, if I'm in the recovery room and I stop breathing, I don't want to be intubated. If I get an arrhythmia, I don't want to treat it. If my heart stops, I don't want any medications. I don't want uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. I don't want to be defibrillated. Well, I was the doctor, and I said I'm going to operate on you because in order to put you to sleep, you're going to be intubated. You're going to be incapable of breathing. We are going to render you incapable of breathing for a certain period of time, and we're going to breathe for you. We're going to keep you alive. We're going to take care of you. And if 10 minutes after that, you stop breathing on your own, I'm not going to stand there and let you die. But it goes back to the fear in the beginning, doesn't it? I don't want to be on the vent. I don't, but this is a healthy person. So the answer is, I said, I won't do your surgery. He came back to me and said, okay, I understand your position. You're right. It's not Because he had this idea that if he's resuscitated, he's going to be like in coma for the rest of his life. It's not that way. But those, these are fears. And, and they need to be talked about, and they need to be articulated. I'm glad he brought that up, and, we, and I cleared him. We did his surgery. We didn't have to. He was fine. Thank you, God. Okay? Next case. Real case. 78-year-old man with Parkinson's disease falls at home, fractures his hip. The evening after his surgery, he vomits and aspirates stomach contents into his lungs resulting in acute respiratory failure. He is intubated, taken to the comatose to the intensive care unit where he remains unresponsive on the ventilator, not responding to his comatose. Three days later, his family presents a living will document to the doctor and at first asks and then demands that he be removed from the ventilator. So it's a standard document. In the event that I have this, this, or this, remember we talked about end-stage condition? Remember Victoria Flug, uh, Urquiaga straightening me out of the Florida statue? A terminal condition of Florida is any condition untreated will lead to death? Well, you could make that argument that you would qualify for that, couldn't you? Okay? It goes back to this. I wouldn't have to look like that. The question is asked, what good is he? That question was asked to me. What good is he on the ventilator? Five days. No response. He's in a coma. Zero response. The doctor refuses. The family threatens to get a court order to remove the doctor from the case. Two days later, the patient is still unresponsive on the ventilator but otherwise medically stable. No pressors on a vent, some antibiotics, making here and everything's working, not responding at all. The doctor speaks with the patient in the presence of a respiratory therapist. Holding the patient's hand, the doctor offers to discontinue the treatment if the patient would squeeze the doctor's hand. I know you've been through a lot, you're having a tough time. You've been on the vent for five days. Things are tough. I'm sticking with you. If you decide that this is more than you can do or withstand, and you want me to leave you alone and get you off this ventilator, I need a positive response. Squeeze my hand. It's Catholic principle, all right? Whether it's proportionate or disproportionate is his decision, not mine. The patient opened his eyes sat up and shook his head no. <laughs> Ten days later he was transferred to a rehabilitation hospital. Who would want to live like that? So, case in point, that gentleman who was given up for dead as worthless, as irretrievable, when given the option said, I want to fight on. And you prevail, okay? Most of us are 
like that, believe it or not. We don't want to be like this, do we? But if, God forbid, we're like that, almost all of us, unless we have a terminal condition, we're fighting. We don't want to hang on. Last thing I'll leave you with. If you have a loved one in this condition, you're visiting someone, be very aware that although they may not be able to communicate, that they hear what you're saying very clearly. And when they come out of the coma and out of this situation, be careful of what you say. No, but speak respectfully and, and carefully and lovingly and talk to them. Go in and talk to this lady. Hold her hand. Say, we're here. They can hear a lot more than you can think, and that's, of course, really important to them. So here's the to-do list. First, pray for the gift of dying in the state of grace. Read the ERDs. Complete the Catholic Declaration on Life and Death. Appoint a Catholic health care surrogate. And do what you can to oppose this pulse legislation in Florida. Uh, the, the bishops, uh, Bishop Duane was talking to me just a few weeks ago. The, the USCCB is meeting to talk about this pulse initiative at the national level. And the, the Florida bishops are as well. They have a position on it. These are some of the resources there in the handout. There's some really good ones. The diocese has an awesome website, by the way. Hit the website. Look at the different ministries that are there. NCBC Center, CAPMED.org, there's the CMA, Catholic Medical Association website. And that's got a little question.